Hi all, I'd like to show you one of Gary Kasparov's most outrageous games against Victor Cautionary. Victor Cautionary is a real legend in chess. He's many times nearly become world champion. He was stopped unfortunately by Anatoly Karpov on a couple of occasions. In the 1982 chess Olympiad, Switzerland were the host. The mighty Soviet Union team had the two Ks, Karpov and Kasparov, on board for Polygavsky, board for Belyevsky. First reserve was Mikhail Tal, second reserve was Arta Yusupov. Now, the host Switzerland had the honour of Korshnoi playing on board one from them, so ex USSR player, so dramatic scene. So, Viktor Korshnoi playing white against Gary Kasparov. Let's have a look at this really dramatic game. D4. Kasparov starts as though he's going to play the King's Engine defence. He plays knight f6. Victor Cautionary has a fantastic reputation in the King's Engine defence. Massive, heavy score in general against most players. It seems as though it fits in with his strategic understanding of the game. Not too tactical. You can often have very thematic ideas. c4, g6. And now Victor chooses the Fincetto variation. So choosing this weapon of choice, perhaps to try and keep the tactics under control, not give black too much opportunity for a kingside attack later. <clears throat> so bishop g7, bishop g2, and now an interesting decision already. Gary Kasparov elects to try and transpose this opening into the Benoni defence, the modern Benoni, c5, he's changing the pawn structure, d5, d6, all it needs now is for this pawn to come and take this pawn to have the classic Benoni structure, Benoni as in the son of sorrow, it's not meant to be the most sound opening but very dynamic and aggressive, it fits in with Gary Kasparov's style of play, let's see, knight c3, black castles, Knight f3, and now we have this transposition into the Benoni with e6, white castles, e takes d5, c takes d5. So in the Benoni, we have this weak pawn, often thematically, white's playing for knight d2 to c4. Black has the poor majority on the queen side, black has e file pressure, but this is the main concern quite often for the player with the black pieces, the d6 pawn. That's literally the son of the sorrow of sorrow in terms of pawn structure here. Now a classic plan by Xperoff A6 just to try and get B5 to start utilizing the queenside pawn majority. Victor plays this routine like move A4 just clamping down on B5. Rook E8 keeping the pressure on the E file. White plays now Knight D2 regaining a lot of control on E4 and as though Knight C4 hitting D6. Now we see this move, knight bd7. So here, with knight bd7, where is the knight going? e5 or f8? Well, for the moment, Victor Korshnoi played h3, restricting a maneuver like knight g4, perhaps to e5, if that would have been useful at some point. Rook b8, getting on with things as though b5 is on the cards. Now here, knight c4 hitting d6. Kasparov reacts with knight e5 defending d6, challenging the knight. The knight for a moment steps back and basically says to black, I'm going to play f4, I'm going to drive your knight back and then I'll play knight c4 again and I'll torture your son of sorrow, this pawn on d6. Positional torture. We have this move now which highlights something else about the position here though. Knight h5, it highlights that perhaps Black's king side isn't as safe as it might appear with that Fincetto. These knights are over here. Often in Garrick Sparth games, when the opponent has pieces on the queen side, he can often sometimes whip up things against the opponent's king. Can he do that here? White plays in this position e4. Okay, so here e4, and now. It looks as though if black wants to play aggressively with f5, that's asking for big trouble here. 
Why could just take and if we take with a pawn we lose this one. And if we took with a piece then g4 would just be winning a piece there. But Kasparov's next move looks as though it has it gives the impression that he wants to play f5 anyway but with the rook supporting f5 now. So has the rook done its job on e8 coming back to f8 the first outrageous looking move just coming back as though f5 is on the cards. We see the move from Victor Cautionary Queen sorry the move here played by Victor Cautionary is King H2. Uh, some commentators have indicated that maybe Queen E2 just to try and keep the bind against B5 would have been a bit safer. So why would the King be a problem on H2? Well let's see now something really spectacular is about to happen. Black does play f5. And now this idea of winning the piece is not quite working. If white plays e takes to try and win a piece with g4, this doesn't quite work here with the king on h2. Black could play bishop takes after takes check. And this is really dangerous. It's winning for black. White takes g4. Look at white's pieces on the queen side. They're not helping white's king safety at all. So in this position, Forget e takes f5, but what about f4? If the knight goes back, then white's won positionally because surely then something like knight c4 is going to be strong. Hitting that d6, and then white can carry on strangling black, maybe with a5 later, maybe with e5 later, supported, and it will start to get really nasty. So the knight really can't leave, it seems here, without incurring a positional disadvantage. And here is something which really it becomes absolutely magical now. The knight is really um, left here now and not just for this move but for the next few moves believe it or not. Black, Kasparov playing black plays b5. He's sacrificing a pawn on the queen side simultaneously sacrificing his knight on e5. What is going on here? Well if the knight is taken here, then black seems to have two dangerous options always taking on g3 with this knight or bishop takes e5. For example, knight takes g3 could bring the king out to play like this, and black can actually regain the piece with b4 there. So that's not so unsound as you might think. That's really dangerous after b5. So there is this threat, of course, of b4 now as well, which Cautionary tries to extinguish first before thinking about taking the knight on e5. And he's going to win a pawn, of course. But how to win this pawn safely? Well, he plays a takes b5, a takes b5, and which knight to take? Well, he actually takes with the a knight, and this is actually a little bit better than taking with the c knight, because the a6 square is covered with the rook. If he had taken with the c knight, then there's always this bishop a6 resource lurking behind the scenes, useful for black. For example, taking on e4, bishop a6 could be used immediately here. And this, this actually gives black an interesting position, this pressure along this diagonal. Black would be uh, doing very well here. So the way Kulshnoi took the pawn to be a clear pawn up, in, in theory a clear pawn up, is with the a knight clearing the way for a6 to be controlled here against bishop a6 as a resource and still you know the question to this knight is it going to move soon well again it doesn't move but now Kasparov a pawn down he plays f takes e4 some interesting things here this bishop's actually looking at h3 the knight is actually looking at g3 there's a lot of actual scrutiny on the king side here so we've got an interesting uh, position indeed uh, knight takes his rule out, we can just take the knight there. So bishop takes, leaving h3 for a moment. Gasparov now plays bishop d7. So looking at this knight, tempting it to take on d6. Very interesting. Or take this one still. Uh, but that's that looks in principle just too dangerous in many of these variations. Because of either bishop takes or knight takes. 
But let's have a quick look at knight takes d6 here. This wasn't played. Queen e2 supporting the knight was played. If knight takes d6, this is an interesting position showing the dynamics of black's position. Queen f6 hitting the knight. If bishop g2, we can take here. And this is really quite dangerous. Black's okay here. Uh, White's king safety is being compromised along this diagonal. It seems really too dangerous uh, to weaken this diagonal any further. So this is a very really interesting move. It, tempting knight takes d6. Yeah, so let's have a look at that again. Queen f6. Now here you might think, well, hold on, f takes. Let's check this out here. In fact, even stronger than taking on f1 might actually be queen takes e5 here. So again, g3, d6. There's a lot of pressure here. For example, taking, taking. Um, black has got a lot of pressure. Black can't be doing that badly here. White's king side is really compromised. Look at the scrutiny on White's pawns here. So Victor is trying to keep his king safety intact. He plays actually queen e2. And now we see the pressure being built up. Alabenko Gambit, Queen B6 on this B file with Queen B6. Again, this knight spectacularly being left here. If the knight takes D6, you might think, is this is this an improvement instead of taking here? What about taking now? Not really. Taking, taking. Bishop takes. We've got huge pressure on G3 here. So the knight's left again. This knight just goes back, in fact. Of course, it would welcome this knight going back for knight c4. But uh, Gary Sparov mounts up the pressure with rook b e8. This might have been technically the moment where white could consider f takes e5. He played actually bishop d2, offering a kind of poison pawn to Gary Sparov to, to regain material, but his queen surely uh, might be a problem there. But at this very moment, instead of bishop d2, f takes might actually be, okay, very scary to play, but after knight takes g3, taking, king takes, with the queen over here, this might not be an immediately fatal attack. White technically might be better here in this position. So this could have been the moment for Victor to leave his bishop on c1 and consider taking on e5. But incredibly complex and time pressure uh, must have been coming in now at this point in the game. It's just an incredibly complex game. So bishop d2, does sort of have, really have the cheek to take this b2 pawn, this poison pawn, classic poison pawn on b2? Well, he does actually, he does actually take this pawn and it's got a tactical significance. With taking this pawn, looking at a1, c3, and a3, there's also this pin, knight f3 check, which is now threatened. Knight f3 based on the pin on f3. If rook takes, then queen takes a1. If queen takes, then queen takes d2. So queen takes b2 is actually with the idea of knight f3 check. And it's this annoyance, this annoying fact here, that the cheek of queen takes b2 because of this knight f3 that maybe now Victor tries to punish this knight but this might have been the moment here where Victor is not a pawn down or anything black's got his pawn back but maybe this is the moment to play knight c2 this might be the technically uh, the best move threatening to win the queen if the queen now goes back this is probably the best move queen b7 one of the better moves then this kind of continuation, looking at h3, is still okay for, for black. There's still some dynamic play. Um, but uh, this might have been white's best chance, best course of action. White has some uh, defending to do here. It looks a little bit scary, but maybe technically it's possible. But uh, what happens now is white doesn't play knight c2. White plays f takes e5. So finally, the knight's taken. Gary Kasparov plays bishop takes e5. So we get this raf on g3. This, these pieces are really coordinating on g3. So much for this problem pawn. Black's dark square play 
is really in evidence here and the Queen is also pretty dangerous installed on B2 at this moment but now Knight C4 kicking the Queen or is it does the Queen have to move if I give you five seconds here what would you play with black would you move the Queen back or would you do something else very dramatic position no you could just do something else knight takes g3 you can counterattack the opponent's queen and it will be with check this is what happened knight takes g3 victor plays rook takes f8 after rook takes f8 he moves his queen it's an un unfortunate position here his pieces are all quite loose here he decides to move his queen to e1 he doesn't really want to lose his queen with check here. Uh, that doesn't look too promising at all because then, for example, c3 is dropping. For example, check and then c3 is loose as an example. So he moves his queen and it's kind of admission of defeat in a way, queen e1. That black is doing very well now. Knight takes e4 check, discovered check. Okay, so here, if knight takes e5, then black can consider exploiting d2. So now, here, king g2 instead, still keeping the threat on the queen, still protecting the bishop. But now the queen just moves to c2. Horrible pressure on white's position here. These two pieces here neither of which don't look too attractive to take uh, white seems to be crumbling if he took with this one for example a1 might be taken and then e4 after of queen takes so white seems to be crumbling knight takes e5 was played and if only white can consolidate with knight takes e4 backsprof doesn't want to give him a chance he doesn't do the ordinary recapture he plays rook f2 check and now victor plays the best practical chance he plays queen takes f2 he's getting quite a few pieces for the queen here after this knight takes f2 rook a2 protecting d2 with tempo queen f5 Knight takes d7. Black is only left with two attacking pieces here. And black's king looks a little bit unsafe. In fact, this bishop's covering an exit point for black. Can the rook and the knight and these guys just coordinate against black's king? A very dramatic position. It's here that Garrick's made his first major mistake. In fact, technically, he has the advantage here. But he needs to play accurately. Even Gasparov faltered here. His best is to play knight takes h3, and technically black will be doing very well with knight takes h3. For example, check here, rook a7, there's g5. And although it's scary to be walking in front of the discovered check, this should be very good for black. But Gasparov in this position played after knight takes d7, knight d3 and now victor under great pressure and time pressure played a return blunder he could have actually forced a draw victor cautionary played bishop h6 which seems natural and strong cutting off the king for rook a8 check but in fact he can make things run with check here uh, more forcibly if he played rook a8 check King g7, allowing King g7. It seems a paradox to allow King g7. But here, Rook a7. And Black has nothing more but to accept a draw here. It's just too dangerous. For example, check. And if Queen takes d2, Knight e5 check, believe it or not, is forcing a draw. Say, King g8, check here check the king dare not ever venture out here because say king h6 knight g4 check here rook takes h7 and then knight e4 forking queen and king 
So the king is actually caught, it seems, in this position, in a perpetual check scenario. So a very difficult position uh, to visualize, but uh, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any escape for the king here. There's perpetual checks coming. Or even worse, if this knight gets involved. An amusing variation as an example if black wanted to escape in another way without losing his queen to knight e4 off the check. Yeah, so no king f6, knight e4. Uh, but if the king wanted to try and wriggle here to f8, look at this. Check here. Check. King e7. Check. King d8. So we want to wriggle our king out of this. Check. And now the thing is, if we let this knight come involved, this is what happens. Knight b5 check, king b7. Rook a7 check, and now uh, black's in big trouble. If king here, then there's knight c6 check, and getting mated, ouch, with two knights and the rook. And if the king wanted to try and escape here, with king b6, then we have a familiar looking fork. Knight c4 check, winning the queen takes what would be a rook up. So that's why it's kind of forcing a perpetual check. This position, it's remarkable that the intuitive move is not as good as the check move here, keeping the knight. Uh, so, but in the game, bishop h6 was played. So after knight d3, a return blunder. So two blunders in a row, really. Although it look, looks good, we have now queen takes d7. That knight was very useful. Now we have check. The king is able to escape by a hair's breath here to f7. Rook h8. And now defending h7 by moving the king, not minding knight e4 check. Just king e5 if knight e4. Perhaps. So here King F three was played after Queen takes H three. Victor Korshnoy resigned. He's losing, for example, this bishop here. It's end of the attack. And then the king will have G seven after that. But what an exciting game. So many variations to analyze, but I think with such a game. I think we have to remember the, the culture of the, the opening. The, the modern Bologna is one of the most dramatic openings. If we remember the 1972 match between Fischer and Spassky. Fischer's first win in the classic 1972 World Championship match was with the Bononi. It can really hit hard on the dark squares. That d6 pawn was proven in this game not to be such a, a practical liability. Uh, if black can drum up counterplay elsewhere. Angsparth did so first on the queen side sacrificing a pawn and then when later it was like taken just at the wrong moment it seems when there was knight c2 to be able to consolidate the position and then black seemed to generate huge compensation but two blunders in a row otherwise Korshnoi could have actually forced the draw it seems he missed an opportunity to force a draw and then Kasparov was back in in the end in the end actually Victor Korshnoi had lost on time it seems from the reports on the excellent Olympiad site called Olymp Base, where you can check all the Olympiads. So this was the Olympiad held in Switzerland in 1982, a fantastic encounter. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.